is the first review of the webinar on popular economies in Latin America organized by the Claxo workgroup uh, called Popular Economies, a Theoretical and Practical Mapping, as well as the Andean Office of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and the Miranda International Center. Uh, this webinar consists of a series of video forums as well as some interviews with specialists like the one we will present today. Uh, this first session of uh, the first session of the webinar explored the links between common goods, labor, and the crises of social reproduction. Uh, the second session deals with issues related to popular economies, self-sufficiency regimes, and organizational infrastructures. And the third and final session uh, will focus on public policies, finances, and public and popular economies. My name is Mariana Garcia Soho. I am part of the Claxo Working Group on Popular Economies. I will, conducting, I will be conducting this interview today, uh, along with my research partners, Hernan Vargas and Edith Pineda, and of course, our brilliant interviewee, Alessandra Misadri. Um, Alessandra Misadri uh, has a degree in economics from La Sapienza, Rome, uh, and a degree in development studies uh, from S SOAS, SOAS, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, Alessandra, <laughs> SOAS University, uh, where she completed a PhD on the manufacture of cheap labor in the Indian garment industry, uh, with an emphasis on the labor regime that characterizes the industry and its global and localized patterns of labor, of labor control. Uh, she writes and teaches on issues of inequality in trade, uh, global commodity chains and production networks, labor informality, uh, informalization and labor regimes, global labor standards, uh, corporate social responsibility and modern slavery, feminism's role in development, uh, gender and globalization, social reproduction and reproductive work, and the political economy of India. Uh, Alessandra has been also very active in collaborating with international organizations and NGOs such as uh, ILO, ActionAid, uh, Labor Behind the Label, War on Want, uh, Slavery International on issues related to gender and labor, uh, global labor standards, anti such up campaigns, and the fight against modern slavery. So in order to get started, uh, I think it it's important to clarify our notion of popular economies. Uh, we understand these as heterogeneous economic, social, political, and cultural formations that constitute networks of processes and practices meant to achieve the reproduction of life in the midst of highly precarious contexts. Popular econo economies express a debate that is at once epistemological, theoretical, historical, and political. Uh, today, popular economies are one of the groups most affected by the multiple crises and at the same time, they constitute spaces of resistance to its most devastating effects. They actively participate in the dialogue with government policies, uh, yet at the same time, they are building self-managing organizations. They play a leading role in food production chains, both in urban and rural areas. And at the same time, these economies are some of the most affected by pandemic-related policies of mobility reduction and militarization of common areas and resources. They are the first to see their income slashed by these policies, and at the same time, they are some of the most dynamic in providing community-based solutions. So, in order to get started, uh, our first question has to do with social reproduction, Alessandra. Um, Social reproduction is a term somewhat little referred to in public political and economic debates, at least in the mainstream. So why do you think it's important to focus on social reproduction? Why is it something that we should be discussing? Uh, first, I want to thank you for the kind introduction and for the invitation to um, be one of the speakers at one of your seminars that's much appreciated it's great um, to uh, meet you um, uh, today uh, starting from uh, uh, social reproduction yes well it's a term that i think is crucial if we want to uh, combine uh, understandings of regeneration of capitalist relations with uh, uh, what happens 
in the realms of life making activities. I think there are many definitions of social reproduction. The one that I prefer is the one provided by Cindy Katz, the Marxist uh, ge uh, feminist geographer, um, who defines it as the ensemble of activities that aim at the daily and the intergenerational regeneration of uh, life as well as uh, of capitalist relations. So it's a term that by its own nature places uh, the reproduction of capitalism and the reproduction of life in conversation. And uh, in doing so, I would say it adds both to Marxist debates as well as to feminist debates. So Marx, Marxists have a tendency to talk about reproduction only in relation to the reproduction and regeneration of circuits of capital. And instead feminists, uh, or at least the, um, the old like tradition of uh, 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 liberal feminism, which have also produced a number of very interesting and insightful studies tend to instead focus on reproductive activities as exceptional activities. So to just uh, study the exceptionalism of domestic work and care work, while a term like social reproduction sits in between and actually uh, highlights the interconnections between uh, 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 profit making and life making activities. Wonderful, Alessandra. Thank you. That was very clear. Um, okay, so. Um, how would you characterize the contribution of social reproduction to the generation of value in contemporary capitalism? Which I think is very much in line with what we were just saying. Yeah, this is, uh, of course, a very sort of uh, sensitive uh, debate, which uh, bring us back uh, to the early uh, Marxist feminist contribution on value in the 1970s. Uh, Marx focused primarily on the realm of commodity production. So in his work, he places uh, the source of uh, value in uh, this realm. So it's a productivist understanding of value, which however has to be understood in light of what Marx was really doing. Marx was providing a critique of classic political economy and because classic political economy actually always took the value of labor as exogenous, his uh, uh, critique ends up in reproducing this uh, productivism which characterized the old corpus of uh, classic political economy. So already interventions in the 1970s from workerist and uh, uh, autonomous uh, uh, um, scholars highlighted how instead we need to understand the value producing networks of capitalism exceeding production and the entire society organized uh, along uh, uh, well to, to sort of regenerate capitalist relations. This is a concept uh, first elaborated by Mario Tronti with the concept of uh, the social factory and which then Marxist feminist uh, uh, built on highlighting the reproductive linkages that uh, established the regeneration of this social factory. So basically in uh, the 1970s, people like Silvia Federici, Maria Rosa Dalla Costa, uh, Selma James, uh, um, eh, 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 Leopoldina Fortunati, highlighted how the production of the worker, which is the essential, uh, uh, um, which is the essential, uh, and labor power, which is the essential commodity under capitalism, uh, uh, has to be consider part and parcel of uh, the production and generation of, on, of value. So in this uh, uh, particular light, uh, housework and care work become central uh, to the uh, whole process of value generation. Now, this is uh, the early uh, contribution of uh, Marxist feminist uh, uh, um, uh, debates on how we can actually provide a more inclusive conceptualization of value. I would say that today, because we see a um, rise and exponential uh, 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 sort of re um, a, a, a regeneration of informalized labor relations, uh, we can identify new ways in which uh, we shall include the reproductive activities and realm in uh, accounts of what counts as uh, uh, value. And particularly if you refer to the uh, object of study here, um, Economias Populares, you will see that uh, uh, it's really virtually impossible to distinguish between uh, produ 
productive circuits and reproductive circuits uh, in relation to highly flexible and informalized uh, social formations. So you need to actually uh, um, sort of have an understanding of what generates value, which is more inclusive and does not separate neatly between uh, productive and reproductive circuits. Okay, thank you, Alexandra. And um, what would you uh, what would you say are some of the most common forms of labor today? Uh, looking at it from the perspective of social reproduction. Well, more than looking from the perspective of social reproduction, let's start from what the data says. Okay, so we start from uh, sort of uh, data which uh, we'll find. Uh, non-controversial. We take the International Labor Organization's 2018-19 uh, data and we see what they say. Basically, we have 69.8% uh, of uh, uh, the working population in uh, developing uh, and emerging economies, uh, uh, what we can call the majority world, uh, which is uh, organized in informal and informalized labor relations. And actually at the world level, you also find all, overall around 60%. It means that the majority of us on planet Earth actually <laughs> labors in ways which are highly informal and where it's, you find uh, 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 the intersections between productive and reproductive circuits, which are fundamental for us to understand how the process of exploitation actually uh, takes place. So in this respect, I would say, starting from the type of labor relations which characterize uh, the world of work today, we can say that uh, the social reproduction lens is fundamental. And as this lens is fundamental, as is, uh, uh, the necessity to actually rework and adapt categories, which in uh, traditional Marxist traditions have uh, instead been uh, uh, primarily uh, uh, sort of uh, theorized in relation to production. And these are, of course, value generation and, of course, exploitation. And regarding the debate on wages, uh, there is a lot of criticism on the uh, usefulness of fixing wages. Uh, what would be some alternatives today to define the value of labor as opposed to fixing wages? Well, well, of course, uh, I'm not arguing that uh, the wage uh, has uh, had no meaning in the world of work, but I mean, the wage is uh, the cost of labor and not uh, the representation of its value, which are two very separate things. So uh, when we move uh, to the realm of policy, which is where the debate on fixing waging is about, I would say that uh, uh, a, the elaboration of policies which take into consideration the relevance uh, of reproduction and the reproductive linkages uh, in uh, shaping exploitation is one whereby we do discuss the relevance of uh, wage-related increases and linkages, for instance, to uh, inflation index in economics. That, of course, is, is, is a matter of factly uh, relation. But we also shall discuss uh, a number of uh, different policies uh, that uh, uh, are more all-encompassing, like, for instance, uh, the, um, uh, the um, uh, sort of uh, elaboration of uh, policies uh, concerning uh, uh, income provision. And uh, here, of course, the feminists have done a lot of work on this. And what is uh, in the mainstream literature referred to as basic income, many feminist networks already refer to as uh, self-determination uh, income for a very long time, income that can recognize uh, uh, people in uh, uh, non-paid activities or wageless activities, uh, which relate, which engage in uh, crucial uh, care, uh, uh, forms of care provision, etc. And of course, with the provision of uh, 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 welfare uh, services, uh, so a combination of uh, all these uh, uh, policy instruments is the one that uh, uh, is gonna is likely to deliver for the majority. Not simply uh, policies that stress the relevance of the wages, which of course we should all stress. But so we're not diminishing the debate on wages. If we also highlight the other instruments that are necessary to the world of work today to actually make it particularly in COVID times. Okay, and 
going a bit back to something or, or something that you've mentioned uh, repeatedly so far regarding uh, the significant uh, contributions that feminist theory has have done to this debate, I wanted to ask you, uh, we know feminist theory has been key in identifying a lot of these issues that we've been discussing, but among the wide spectrum of feminist currents and theory that have made contributions on the issue of social reproduction, do you think there are a uh, rather more general consensus uh, around the issue of social reproduction or are there more differences in approaches? I think uh, when it comes to uh, feminists engaged in approaches that which uh, are centered around social reproduction, you can find uh, an awful lot in common. So uh, two main streams which all of us have in common is one, the uh, a process of rethinking ways uh, to uh, study um, oppression under capitalism in ways that stress the co-constitution of social oppression in processes that, that generate class and they generate labor. So while in orthodox Marxist circles, for instance, there is a tendency to reify class as the primary uh, lens. And there has been a tendency um, uh, in some orthodoxies to sort of uh, discount issues of gender and race to uh, epiphenomenal sort of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, secondary structures, if you want. Uh, social reproduction perspectives uh, they all like stress the relevance uh, of uh, understanding uh, class under capitalism as co-constituted and effectively paved by processes of uh, feminization, racialization, ethnicization, orderization, if you want. So these are not adjectives. These are the very essence of uh, 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 class formation, impoverishment. And in all, in, in uh, this particular, uh, um, uh, on, on this particular concern, I would say that all social reproduction feminists actually pretty much agree. And there is, uh, 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 there is uh, 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 also an attempt to sort of bridge uh, analysis uh, uh, of class under this particular lens with the intersectional feminists, which have also done a fantastic work, especially on understandings of race and racial capitalism. So on this, I think we are pretty much all, the majority of us on the same, uh, uh, in the same line. There's also a second line of common interest and common development, which concerns uh, uh, processes of what happened to social reproduction in the last uh, four decades, five decades under neoliberalism. And again, you find a lot of line of intersections uh, between, uh, say, theorization by Nancy Fraser, theorization by Titi Bhattacharya, theorizations by Cindy Katz, theorizations by Isabella Bakker, theorizations by even like some of the Indian comrades, uh, Roini Hensman, people that have been working on what has happened under neoliberalism and have stressed the ways in which uh, the commodification of social reproduction has taken place, both in relation to the world of work, the traditional world of work, as well as in relation to new forms of labor, which have been generated through this uh, ongoing process of commodification. Um, new circuits of surrogacy, uh, the uh, hyper globalization of sex work, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you know, uh, 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 um, phenomena and processes that have entailed new threats for women and, and, and the subaltern groups, as well as open up new uh, cradles and opportunities for resistance. So the effect of these transformations then is what is, is debated. This is again is a second line where we can find a lot of points of continuity. Where I think uh, uh, many of us actually differ is on the debate on value and the fact that you have some uh, uh, sort of uh, within the social reproduction debate uh, as it's currently formed that insists uh, that uh, we should distinguish between uh, value, what produces value and what does not produce value. So to understand social reproduction as enabling value, but not directly contributed to value when not connected to commodity production. And instead, those of us, they are more connected with the early social reproduction debates, which inst instead aim to scale 
up that debate and say, actually, we should go back to having this theoretical discussion because instead, uh, social reproduction has to be seen as central to the production of value. So this, I think, is uh, primarily the difference, but there is a lot of continuities uh, and indeed, I would say, a lot of uh, common political goals. Okay. Um, you've also mentioned in some of your work uh, the dangers of looking at capitalism patriarchy as separate systems uh, because it produces dual theories. So, um, in your opinion, what are some of the consequences of, of doing that, of producing dual theories? And what could be perhaps some uh, key aspects that could help us to you know, avoid producing dual theories when making contributions to uh, a, a general theory, so to speak, of social reproduction? Okay, so the debate on uh, dual theory uh, it traces back to uh, materialist feminists and the work of people like Delphi and others. And I would say it's always useful to place this contribution in historical perspective. Because, you know, when these were created, we were just dominated by very orthodox uh, Marxist tradition that tend to discount the issues of women's liberation as a secondary uh, to a secondary moment of struggle, while the first primary struggle was the one against capital. So now this was, of course, very problematic. The answer of materialist feminists was one whereby they theorized uh, capitalism and patriarchy as uh, modes of production. And that, of course, uh, while it's understanding uh, uh, the, 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 the necessity to respond to orthodoxies, I think this was a major mistake because uh, it just uh, separates, uh, it doesn't reconcile and unify, but it, it just uh, continues separating uh, uh, the history of capitalism from the history of women's oppression. While instead, of course, uh, you need to uh, generate a unitary theory on this particular issue, Cinzia Ruzza is probably the one that has uh, produced the most interesting analysis or the most interesting critique of uh, dual, uh, theories and of course triple theories, those that actually add race uh, uh, to this whole corpus of, of, of theorization. Um, and uh, uh, of course you have a, a, a cul-de-sac, both for those that are actually more concerned with capitalism as well as those that are more concerned with the, with the uh, women's liberation. On the one hand, you have that uh, with the, uh, 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 these dual systems, uh, you are uh, still able to theorize capitalism as disconnected from gender oppression, which is ridiculous. If we imagine even the, again, the word of work today, we imagine a, a, a maquila, in, in Latin America, of course, uh, gender oppression structures the very basis of the assembly line on which then accumulation is generated. So you cannot really separate the two at all. At the same time, the fact that uh, is these feminists try to instead uh, identify or isolate uh, women's oppression as distinct from uh, capitalist oppression is also been very problematic and if something he has evolved in uh, uh, patterns of uh, uber liberal feminism that has concentrated on the glass ceiling or has concentrated on understandings of uh, gender inequality which are not connected to uh, capitalism in itself and a way to overcome this is like to accept again that you have uh, a process whereby class uh, gender and racial oppression co-constitute each other. And so the fight is a unitary fight because effectively you're fighting the same thing. Capitalism has always been racial and capitalism has always been patriarchal. So you, you find it in the uh, exceptional work of uh, uh, Cedric Robinson, you find it in the exceptional work of Silvia Federici, the very fact that uh, primitive accumulation has always been on the one hand connected to slavery, to dispossession of indigenous community and first uh, uh, nations, uh, to slavery, etc. And at the same time has always been connected to processes that have domesticated women and placed them in the home. So this is like uh, what uh, 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 we have now uh, wonderful accounts of. And these accounts help us to sort of theorize a history of capitalism, which take into consideration is racial and patriarchal features. So we don't need to rely on uh, sort of uh, divisive theories any longer. We 
do have the intellectual and theoretical instruments uh, 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 and the historical instruments not to do so. Wonderful. So, Alessandra, um, I wanted to ask you uh, now, thinking more specifically about the situation uh, with COVID-19 and the, what it has implied globally for the entire world. Um, we know, as Nancy Fraser has uh, pointed out, that although capitalism has always been based on a regime of social reproduction, what do you think are the fundamental characteristics of the current regime of social reproduction? And could we possibly be facing a new uh, regime uh, post-COVID? Yeah, this is uh, the million dollar question actually. How much of this is contingent and how much of this uh, actually will stay on? And I tend to believe that it's gonna probably be a mix of uh, both. Uh, with, uh, again, uh, a lot of threats, of course, and a lot of opportunities. When I was writing about the crisis in the midst of that in uh, April, May, I just uh, uh, identified what I thought they were the crucial elements of this crisis in the uh, unexploitability of the uh, labor force that is uh, suddenly withdrawn by the labor market all together and chucked at home and this creating a process of conflation between productive and reproductive time on a massive scale i myself have been turned into a home worker from the moment to the next i'm still gonna be as an academic worker and home worker until january so these are like unprecedented times and to an extent i think some of this will fade away some of this has already faded away in the sense that if you look at the unexploitability there was a, a sort of the halt in the system, but then the system managed to reboot itself quite easily, even with some of the instruments we're using for this uh, very interview, right? So that, I mean, a lot of the work we do today can actually be done remotely, and there are just different ways in which we can uh, actually organize, particularly now that we move from phase one to phase two of the global lo lockdown in many places, uh, at least uh, uh, in some parts of the world. Now, the, uh, a conflation between productive and reproductive time is what instead lingers on. And this is where I think a lot of attention has to be placed because uh, sadly I think that if attention is not being given to the ways in which uh, this process is generating now multiple forms of new homeworking, we risk uh, to have to review debates or review like uh, struggles uh, that will become again that we thought they were given for granted, but they will become again instead very important. So I see, for instance, the coming of a new struggles around the working day and what it means and what is the boundary between productive and reproductive life, which although fictitious is necessary for us to put, to put a drawing line on uh, the process of exploitation of our work. Because you end up in having this never ending day, which is exactly the type of day that I've been describing in much of my work on home workers uh, uh, in India and elsewhere. That you have this conflation between production and reproduction, which then leads to an exponential rise uh, to exploitation rates and to a conflation between uh, 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 sort of the times you dedicate uh, to labor uh, 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 and times that you instead uh, uh, do not dedicate to labor. So this is something we uh, unions uh, and labor organization have to pay huge attention towards. And then of course, new understanding of uh, health uh, uh, provisions uh, 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 at work, particularly for a labor force that increasingly will use the home as the main uh, uh, site of uh, work for a while. Um, a lot of people will go back to work, a lot of people will not. So we'll have to see how this pans out. Of course, this also places huge questions around organizing. So for instance, we've seen this very clearly around uh, 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 activism around universities, which have been massively restructured due to the crisis here in the UK, and it's really difficult to sort of organize remotely, right? Uh, of course, again, I expect that from phase one to two, there'll be changes, but how you reimagine activism sitting from home, 
uh, it's it's uh, really a, a, an important question to ask. Uh, in, we see that even more when we look at informal economies, uh, because you have uh, a lot of pressure and policing around aggregation, around uh, demonstrations, around uh, uh, clusters of people. And so this will make it more difficult uh, to organize particularly sections of societies that really struggle to organize, uh, to fight for the rights, uh, even in a pre-COVID uh, uh, time. Uh, so I think this particular aspect is the one that we'll have uh, to sort of uh, continue uh, pay attention to. And uh, also I think of course that the, um, the pandemic has, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, really unveiled in a tragic way, uh, the highly unequal access uh, to health uh, uh, resources and provisions we actually had, because the end up, it ended up in just sort of uh, uh, not being a crisis for everyone uh, at all, but with the, some segments of the population being hit uh, tremendously hard um, across uh, uh, many uh, national economies. Um, thank you. you. You actually answered many other questions that I wanted to ask you. Um, but regarding the policies of what we refer to as the management of death during this COVID-19 juncture that we are experiencing globally, uh, some very fundamental questions arise. Um, is, it, is it possible to assert that there is in fact an uneven distribution of death according to uh, classes and different systems of, systems of oppression and the relations between center and the periphery? Uh, I, we also wonder, you've denounced in your work the development of, of, of Hobbesian policies. So could you give us some examples of that and what that means? And finally, um, could there be any uh, specific policies developed to deal with uh, not only death from COVID specifically, but uh, the death by uh, the disappearance or, or the closure of uh, economic uh, outlets or spaces for economic trade, especially for informalized economies. Yeah. I might have to uh, ask you to remind me some of the uh, lines of these questions, but starting from the uh, politics uh, of managing death, I think uh, one uh, was read the accounts of who actually died primarily uh, during the crisis, uh, particularly when it relates to health workers uh, and frontline workers that were more exposed, uh, particularly in the periods of uh, high viral load, uh, as well as uh, uh, those that had less access uh, to health provision, particularly in countries where you have privatized health provision like the US, uh, it's a no brainer who actually uh, died, okay? So there's a huge representation of uh, 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 BAME uh, 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 people in the US and the UK. Here, I think the rates were staggering. Some 68% of all deaths were just uh, uh, people of color in, in the NHS uh, in the first part of the wave, uh, while instead they are just uh, 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 don't even get to 20% of the total population. Of course, there's an overrepresentation of them in terms of uh, frontline workers at, at the NHS, but again, it's not such a overrepresentation to justify those traits. In the US, we have a lot of uh, terrible uh, anecdotal uh, evidence. Uh, we're still waiting for the big aggregate data, but you know, I, I don't know if we're going to actually get the data, but it's pretty uh, clear from uh, the picture that we got uh, across the world, the people that were more exposed, they were the more vulnerable. So we're talking about uh, black and brown people across a number of developed uh, uh, economies. We're looking at indigenous communities in many parts of Latin America. We're looking at uh, uh, low caste and Muslims uh, in India. And there's a lot of accounts that actually uh, look at this. We're looking at asylum seekers uh, uh, and uh, very vulnerable workers uh, in parts of the Mediterranean, which again might be uh, hit by COVID or they might be hit by the measures to prevent COVID, which were deadly uh, 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 by the same uh, uh, um, degree. So I think uh, uh, um, this really uh, talks, uh, 
speaks to uh, what Achille Mbembe's referred to the necropolitics of capitalism, that we actually experience death uh, in, in capitalism as well under highly unequal uh, uh, terms. And uh, um, of course, uh, this uh, uh, poses the question of the fact that COVID-19 has actually unveiled the inequalities which already characterize the system. And at the same time, has deepened those inequalities further, making them particularly lethal. This uh, uh, has also manifested in policies, uh, so actual, in the actual craft of uh, government. Uh, the, here in the UK, they put forward measure to uh, 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 impose on parents to uh, no resuscitation uh, um, uh, orders uh, for autistic children, uh, sort of completely uh, sort of uh, um, not just Hobbesian uh, uh, policies, but uh, policies which uh, in uh, normal times uh, would be completely unacceptable for any civilized nation to actually enforce. So this, if you look at the uh, inequality within uh, countries, I would say that who bore the uh, who has actually been bearing the brunt of COVID is, is quite clearly not the same social groups. We have never been in this together, uh, even in relation to who uh, has been able to stay home, right? So, how, how for how much you can complain about having the kids at home and having to work at home, even being at home has been a privilege. Uh, because many instead had to continue working and being exposed uh, uh, to the virus and that in itself uh, could have, you know, taken a deadly turn. So uh, uh, that uh, 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 for one. If we look at instead inequalities across uh, uh, countries when it comes to which countries uh, have uh, um, sort of uh, 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 suffered more, where we have uh, highest rates of infections, where we have higher rates of, 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 uh, um, of death, we instead have a much more patchwork uh, uh, outcomes. And I think this talks about uh, uh, politics massively. Uh, if you look at countries that uh, score uh, uh, more poorly, are those that are led by right-wing populist uh, 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 government. So you have at the moment, uh, the top, uh, the US of course has just passed 6 million cases with rates of deaths which are just staggering, of course, uh, with an overrepresentation of uh, 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 black and Hispanic people dying. Then you have, uh, um, a, a, you have uh, Bolsonaro's Brazil, which again is a, is a tragic case, and again based on denial, based on you know I don't even know if the debate was heard in unity in that case, and again high rates of infection, high rates of death, which of course uh, uh, particularly among uh, the poor, which has no access to good health provision. Then you have uh, Modi's uh, India, which again is like overcome three million cases at the moment, uh, actually hitting four. And uh, uh, again, with uh, rates of infection in mo the most populous states of Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, which are just staggering. Um, uh, so I, I would say that at the global level, instead, you also have some African countries that have done incredibly well. Like Ghana, for instance, uh, in Asia, you have Vietnam, countries that manage, uh, despite the very limited health systems, to actually enforce uh, a preventive lockdown that actually worked better. So we do not, at the global level, see the straightforward linkages between global north and global south like some analysts have foreseen because politics is still very important in the management of diseases and pandemics and I think this is the lesson that we learn if we look at instead inequality at global level. I didn't want to uh, let this opportunity pass without asking you a very fundamental question that we should have perhaps asked you earlier. <laughs> Regarding uh, what we were speaking about before we started our interview um, in relation to the differences or the possible differences between popular economies and informalized economies or informal economies. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about this difference and not only a, a theoretical difference, but also uh, the difference in the role of these economies within the global south amidst uh, this multiple situation of crises. Uh, especially taking into consideration what you've studied in, in India and Southern Europe. 
I think uh, the uh, ontology of uh, the uh, theoretical tradition that, that uh, sort of uh, tries to engage with informal economies and popular economies uh, is quite different. But as we discussed at uh, the beginning informally bef before the interview actually uh, 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 kicked off, I'd say there's a lot of uh, theoretical and analytical work that needs to be done to actually map the continuities and differences. If you look at the uh, origin of the informal economy and informal sector debates uh, um, is all around economic activities that were not regulated by the legal institutions of a, a, a given uh, a place or were characterized by labor relations which were highly precarious in nature. So in a sense the economic relation at the basis uh, of these activities has always been uh, central as the actual uh, labor relations uh, uh, corresponding to that. Um, I would say that uh, uh, the link also between uh, these informal activities and processes of capitalist penetration has always been central to the sort of uh, definition and theorization of the informal economy. And instead, when it comes to popular economies, uh, which is the literature that I'm just sort of enjoying reading at the moment, and it comes much more from the Latin American tradition now, it stresses much more, uh, on the one hand, the reproductive aspect of living under capitalism through a different channel. So already has a, a sort of uh, the reproductive channel, which is much more stressed, uh, but at the same time, also is centered around the market and trading uh, as uh, a sort of a different sort of uh, uh, linkages, different circuits uh, being very much stressed. While well, instead the literature on the informal economy tends to stress uh, uh, integration and the contribution of this economy to actual formal uh, economy. So not to talk about exclusion, but to talk about the centrality of these economies uh, in the process of capitalist development. I think what uh, uh, place them together is the fact that we need to recognize the centrality in the processes of uh, 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 capitalist development uh, in contemporary times uh, in key economies, in key developing and emerging economies. It, it's where a huge part of uh, 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 laborers actually work across uh, uh, continents. Uh, and at the same time, they, they just do represent uh, a, a key areas of vulnerability, but also key areas of uh, possibility of reappropriation and re-elaboration of uh, 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 modes of, uh, of economic activities, uh, which are alternatives. So it's, it's uh, uh, on the one hand, of course, uh, 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 they are both an opportunity as well as a threat. If you look at the literature coming from Asia and Africa, uh, it tends to stress the marginalization of uh, these economies and the sort of uh, exploitative linkages that intercur between formal and informal economic activities. While instead, in my view, when it comes to the popular economies, there is a, a tendency to stress uh, alternatives and uh, you know other ways of doing things of cooperating uh, of returning to the commons and i would say that uh, it's very important to acknowledge both sides of the coins because it's true that these represent opportunities to actually uh, engage in uh, uh, new forms of uh, uh, resistance against capitalism or just self-organization but at the same time we should not romanticize these networks at all because this networks in many cases are the results of processes of dispossession and impoverishment that has led people to having to find uh, new ways uh, to actually uh, survive and to make life uh, uh, under capitalism. So perhaps, uh, you know, uh, just work uh, to be done in uh, terms of the connections between these two traditions indeed. Thank you, Alexander. Um, I think one of our, uh, our other interviewers, uh, Hernan, has a question. So let's sure. do it. So, Alessandra, maybe uh, uh, important when I hear you, I can stop to think that uh, maybe this COVID has allowed the possibility that most of the uh, social reproduction regime of the, of the, of the West is actually amplifying into the West. Like, for example, this conflation uh, uh, regime that is actually uh, has been 
going on like uh, since a lot in the in Asia in Africa but now we have it more amplified in the rest of the world so I can stop thinking that maybe from here from Latin America which is also uh, part of the rest part of the global south uh, but maybe we are thinking in Asia and Africa most of our uh, possible future so I would like to, to, to ask you to, to tell us a little about some uh, forms of, of work like uh, uh, crowd working, uh, maybe the housewifeification, maybe the precariat as new ways of, of work and um, that are part of a social reproduction regime that maybe they are not so developed in Latin America so far. But maybe I think that it's our our next future. So uh, maybe you can uh, tell us a little about how does it work in Asia and in Africa, and and also maybe if you can share with us which kind of struggles uh, have you seen in Asia and Africa that can be also like a reference for all for for us in here in Latin America. Yeah. Okay, so um, you are spot on on the fact that COVID, uh, this is uh, the very few laughable things about this uh, uh, disease actually. But in a sense, it's like one smiles because he has uh, sort of uh, shifted entirely the centrality of the debate on uh, which type of uh, economic and labor relations we live under from uh, Western-centric conceptualization Two conceptualizations which are you know sort of very common in uh, uh, parts of uh, Asian Africa so uh, this uh, exponential rise of home working is seen now as uh, a sort of uh, a, a sign of a new post-COVID modernity but it, as a matter of fact the home worker has been a very subversive figure in the history of African and uh, particularly Asian development that has managed to survive the test of times and it just sort of uh, reproduce itself uh, massively. If you look at a lot of uh, uh, orthodox uh, stagist uh, uh, theorization of capitalism I always uh, assumed that this uh, uh, figure of the home worker would have faded away and uh, it would have given uh, 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 le left the room to wage labor being entirely dominant across society. This is not only hasn't happened but actually COVID is reminding us that it's effectively it's not really uh, 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 the, 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 the stagist uh, development model that has been uh, uh, sort of presented by mainstream economists uh, for almost a hundred years now, but if something as argued by Ian Bremen and Marcel van der Linde, the labor anthropologist and historian, uh, is that the West, which is following the rest. And actually I would say that with COVID, this process has uh, exponentially sort of uh, uh, reason. In, uh, I would uh, speak about India, which is the country that I'm more comfortable uh, uh, about so speaking, although I would say that there are like some uh, points of contact with Medi Mediterranean economies, uh, of course, uh, coming from Italy, uh, it was, you know, not uh, 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 um, uh, particularly new to me, the sort of uh, 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 relevance uh, and uh, uh, proliferation of informal economic activities that I saw in parts of Asia. But for instance, if we look at China, it's entirely different ballgame as it is parts of East Asia, where processes of informality and informalization are conceptualized as an entirely different thing. And then we refer to contractual uh, insecurity. So in India, the, the uh, home based, the forms of home based work, which include homework, but also entail uh, house, household labor, for instance, which will be very much uh, uh, compatible with some of the studies of the uh, Economias Populares that you are actually uh, uh, um, carrying uh, uh, out, is a, 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 a dominant form of work. So. Uh, you know, it's partially captured by the National Sample Survey, uh, which uh, looks at around 15 million, I would say, home workers across India, but it's a massive underestimate. But I would say that you have a, a consistent part of peri-urban and uh, rural India, as well as significant parts of urban India that still organize in this way. If you look at rates, 
of informal employment in the subcontinent. If you exclude agriculture, they accepted 86% of the entire working population. And uh, you have 93% when you consider uh, agriculture. Of course, India is like, uh, it's uh, the exceptional case within the Asian bloc, but you still have very high rates of uh, informality in say Bangladesh, Pakistan, and the old uh, South Asian uh, uh, region. So in a sense, I think uh, what COVID is doing is just uh, uh, making the study and, and theorization of these forms of work uh, more important to understand the type of transformations that uh, we, uh, are seeing as uh, taking place in the world of work uh, in uh, the global north and uh, this has also taken place uh, uh, it was anyway taking place uh, with the spread of uh, uh, um, uh, precarious forms of work uh, 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 undertaken by migrants uh, in many of these economies uh, so for instance uh, we have a lot of reports in the guardian uh, at present on Leicester garment factories, uh, uh, working exactly in the same informal ways uh, in which you would expect uh, a sort of uh, a talleres clandestino to work in Argentina or somewhere else. So I would say that there is uh, a process of uh, uh, sort of uh, implosion of this distinction between what defines the world of work in the global south and in the global north, to an extent, I think the differences were overplayed and they were overplayed because the relevance uh, and the dominance of wage labor in the global north has been overplayed. Uh, and for instance, exclusion of understanding of uh, which type of economies uh, women and subaltern groups were part of. Um, and now with COVID, because of the acceleration of these forms of work, this become less and less possible. And so I think it's a very useful discussion to have because it also necessarily leads to a debate on which new forms of organizing we need to engage with when it comes to forms of work where classically or like traditionally formed unions are really struggling to sort of make a dent in. So um, it, it needs to sort of uh, uh, um, go in this direction, which leads me to your second question, which is around, around uh, organizing. Um, I just uh, think that the debate, the theoretical debate, at least for me, the theoretical debate uh, around production, social reproduction and value, it's of course uh, about theory, but it is about practice. It's about uh, uh, politics. And what we've seen in terms of promising avenues for organizing in places which have specific forms of work that challenge uh, 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 mainstream notions of work as well as mainstream notion of organizing. Uh, a reproductive lens is very important when it comes to understanding how, for instance, the workers that I liaise with in India uh, organize resist or should be organized for them to resist. So classic is uh, in the garment industry, the majority of uh, labor unrest doesn't really take place in factories, but it takes place in the hamlets where actually people live. Of course, these are related very much to the type of exploitation they experience at work, but it's more I mean, it's easier for them, and this is something that the Chinese comrades have written beautifully about. I mean, the work of uh, Punai, the, the Maoist feminist Punai is exceptional in this respect. When she talks about the dormitory labor regime, the fact that uh, you understand labor processes now, they also considering how these workers actually live, especially in contexts like China and India. These are rural workers that actually only stay on in the urban uh, space for a limited period. And uh, not so much, well, in, Ch in China is because of the oppression of the dormitory, but in India is because of the ever changing uh, uh, nature of their employment relations that the best place for them to organize is the, the dormitory, is the industrial hamlet uh, where they live and not the factory. So 
new forms of organizing should actually start from the reproductive uh, 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 realms and places of the workers, the hamlets, the communities where they actually uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, um, where they actually live, rather than still focusing on a factory as a vanguardist sort of classic labor uh, organizing tactic would entail. Um, and in fact, I think this is, might be a, another point of contact between uh, what I saw and what seems to be your uh, sort of uh, uh, um, uh, your, some of your findings about and your theorization of economias populares, the fact that, you know, how you distinguish bet between what, where you work and where you live. And where you live is actually much more important to understand which type of uh, triggers people have to start uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, um, organizing, resisting, uh, to start a, a, a sort of a, a struggle, a riot. Uh, um, and these are generally around housing, around uh, living arrangements, uh, around contractors uh, exploiting them, uh, both inside as well as outside the uh, production place. So that's one. The second is that because you're looking at rural workers, and these will just uh, uh, float back and forth between urban and rural areas, you need to find ways to organize, uh, also considering this missing link. So the fact that you're dealing with the mobile subject is not a secondary complication. And I think unions have struggled across the globe with the fact that you try to organize a worker at the place of work in the urban area, and then these people go back home. So how we think of networks of activism that actually can trace back or lies with the place of origins of workers is another crucial, I would say, um, uh, point when it comes to strategies towards organizing. Of course, it requires an incredible amount of uh, uh, time and uh, uh, resources. But I would say that if we continue only organizing migrant workers at the place of work, we just end up in fighting against uh, uh, um, windmills because then you have uh, that people go back home and new one have to be sort of uh, uh, um, organized once these are replaced. So you're just stuck at what can be defined as a sort of pre-unionized phase, which is very important. It's about uh, often, uh, at least in India, it's about uh, uh, educating uh, uh, ourselves about workers' lives and educating uh, uh, um, workers to their own right to change in the legislation. It's a crucial type of work to do, but there has to be a moment where then you can also organize uh, uh, more structurally. And I think these linkages are quite crucial for that uh, uh, purpose. Thank you, Alessandra. Do you have any other questions or not? I'm fine, I'm really fine. Thank you very much. So thank you, Alessandra, for, for all the openness and the insightfulness and depth of your, of your interventions. Uh, also, thank you to everyone who's uh, viewed this, uh, this video. We invite you all to consult uh, the recordings and the, of the conferences and the podcasts of the webinar uh, on the websites of the organizations uh, involved in this process, which again are the are CLACSO. Uh, the Indian Office of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and the Miranda International Center. Um, Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Alessandra. Gracias a la resaca que no fue.